My name is Rich Harrington, and I am the author of Understanding Adobe Photoshop, as well as a podcast by the same name. And today, I am going to show you how I created this HDR image. Now, I am actually going to be using a third-party plugin today, HDR FX Pro from Nick Software. You can download a demo from their site. But I will point out some techniques that will work with the built-in Merge to HDR Pro that's also in Photoshop. I do like both of them. It just sort of depends upon the project. I find myself using both the Photoshop tools and the Nick tools a fair amount. Let's jump in. I'm going to switch over to Bridge, and the reason why I want to use Bridge here is this is a great way to organize your HDR pictures. So you see here, I've got seven exposures for this particular HDR. Now, when we shot these images, we were on a tripod locked down. That's highly recommended. You'll also see that we shot these in burst mode. So if we look at the times created over here on the right, what you see is that these were created very closely to one another. Very slight delay between each image, and that's fine. So look at that creation date there, just split seconds apart from each other. 26 seconds, 26 seconds, 27 seconds, 27 seconds, 28, 30, and then down here, 32. And those creation dates push out because the brighter images were opened longer to let more light into the camera. Now, if we look at this here, we'll see that the image was taken at an f-stop of 4.8. And as we go through the bracketing, notice how the shutter speed is changing to let in more light. So a four-second exposure, a two-second exposure, one second, five seconds, etc. So pretty straightforward. And uh, I've got these seven images here shooting with seven bracketed image. This is shot on a Nikon D300S, but many DSLRs have bracketing options. Some will only do three images. You could, of course, manually change. But the benefit of that auto bracketing feature is that it will do it for you very quickly with your hands off of the camera to minimize vibration. So let's go ahead and select these images here. I just selected all in the folder. And under the Tools menu, you'll see a couple of things. If I were going to use the Photoshop Merge to HDR command, I would just choose Photoshop Merge to HDR Pro. And I've done tutorials on this past. I love this command. It is so useful in Photoshop Extended. Today, I just want to show you a new tool, uh, Nix Software HDR Effects Pro. And I want to talk to you about how this works. It's very similar. It just offers some additional controls. So let's go ahead and engage that. And it's going to open up these seven raw files loads into the dialog box here and it says select one or more. I'm just going to go ahead here and select all of these. We're just shift clicking. There we go. And I could tell it to remove ghosting. Now because these exposures took a few seconds to create, the clouds might have moved a bit. So we'll choose ghost reduction method and you'll see you have the ability for both adaptive or global. I'll do adaptive and medium strength should be fine because the clouds weren't moving that much. It's looking pretty good. If I want flexibility, I can open as a smart object. Everything looks fine, and we'll click OK. And it's going to go ahead and load all of those images in, and then create a new object that combines them, a new smart object. Now, once those are loaded, and this does take a second here, because you keep in mind you're opening, in this case, seven raw files. They will then load into a new toning dialog box where we could choose to start to mix these exposures together. Now, HDRFX Pro, you could download a demo from the Nick Multimedia website. They are not asking me to do this tutorial. I just like to talk about software that I use, and I find it pretty useful. Looks good. We'll do the update later. And this is the process of aligning the images. Now, if you shoot on a tripod, the alignment process will go very, very fast. If you try to handhold an HDR, it's possible that things can get tweaked and help you out. But it's, again, best to use the tripod. If that's not an option, then be sure to look for a flat surface, maybe a railing or a phone pole you can lean against. Try to get that camera stabilized to minimize the movement, and you'll get much better results. Now, the processing steps here, and if you can't tell, this is called tap dancing. <laughs> it's going to go ahead there 
and it's creating the image. Fortunately, you get nice good updates of what's happening in this process, so you at least feel like you're not waiting forever. And uh, as it finishes creating out that HDR image, it's then going to load it into a new dialog box with a lot of different controls, and I'm going to attempt to walk you through some of those highlights. Here we go. Now the temporary image is not that impressive to start. This is by default a true 32-bit image which has a great working space. You see how we have a lot of color in there. But it does not offer as many of the controls that we want for the stylized look for HDR. Loads in here. It's going to take just a second for the image to update. There it is. Caches in at high res. And you'll see we have a collection of presets to choose from as well as the ability to make our own custom user presets. Now let's start here and we're going to go into a little bit of a landscape category. And you see as we choose different options here it loads in. And these are good starting points. I'm going to go with a gradual contrast here. That's looking pretty good. And what I want to do is refine things just a little bit. Now, one of the great things about the NIC tools are these control points. And I'm finding the brightness and the detail in the trees here to be a little distracting. Yes, it's nice to see that it captured that wide range and managed to capture all the details and the leaves, but I really don't want them. So I'm just going to click and add a control point here. And I have the ability to sort of adjust its size. And then we can go ahead and pull down the exposure. And notice it's pretty intelligent. It automatically starts to detect those edges with that control point. So it only pulled down the exposure on the tree. We can go ahead and expand that a little bit more, and you see that it still did a good job of isolating to that tree. So I've done an exposure compensation there, about 1.5. I'm going to also strip down the color a little bit so they're not so distracting. And we'll add another control point over here on this tree and do the same sort of thing. So let's just pull that down and we will, oops, other way, negative, there we go. And let's just pull the saturation down, and that looks good. Now, if we look at that control point, you can actually click here, and you get the ability to sort of see the mask, and that makes it easier to tell what's being affected. So if we need to reposition that control point, or pull it in just a little bit, you get a pretty good idea of what's being affected at the edges. Now that works well. I'm going to go ahead and just reposition these a bit. I'm happy with that. Let's pull that one down a little. And we'll add one more control point over here. Let's get out of the mask mode for a moment. And we'll pull down the exposure and pull out a little saturation. All right, that's looking pretty good. I am happy with that result. Notice it's done a good job of pretty much isolating to the tree area. And we'll just go ahead and get out of that back to a normal sort of view. There we go. Let's just pull saturation down. Good. And I'm going to drop in one more down here on this tree just to darken that area a bit. And now I am happy with how that's looking. There we go. Good. I find the trees to not be as distracting. Now, let's go ahead and play with the global adjustments here. And you notice that we can merge the exposure down. The great thing about the HDR is that it's capturing a wider range. So the original images, we have these great highlights in here, yet we still have the rich shadows in the background. That's looking good. We've got all sorts of different methods here for our HDR. Notice that we can take a look at things like harsh details, and it's going to go ahead and really pop those, and we can bring that strength up. Or we can do things like a nice natural look, and that's just capturing a wider range with the clouds and the highlights of the buildings. So lots of different choices here, and it's really up to you where you're going to go with. I'm going to go with sharp here initially, just to get the buildings to pop a little more. And I like that. That's looking pretty good. Now, as we're working through here, again, the idea is to remember that you've got some contrast that you can work with. And I'm really going to go ahead and take that just subtly up to get the type of look I'm looking for. 
and I can go ahead here with tone compression and notice how this allows us to merge the multiple images together so we're seeing a wider range from darks to lights. That's looking pretty good there. Now as I go through I'm going to finish this out. I'm going to add another control point up here in the sky and what I want to do is really make those clouds start to pop. So we've got the sky selected. We're going to make a nice big control point and boost the contrast and pull that part of the sky down just a little bit. We'll let that redraw. And you see we're getting pretty good drama. Pull that in a little. There we go. Just a subtle exposure pull down. And that's giving us a nice spot in the sky. We'll do the same thing up here. Pull that down just a little bit and pop the contrast and we can play with the size of that selection. Remember, you can always click here and see what's actually being selected. It makes it a little bit easier to sort of refine your masks and decide what is it that you actually want to select. So I'm pretty happy there. I'm just going to put one more right above the space needle and we'll take the exposure down just a little and the contrast up and play with that size selection toggling in and out of the mask there so it could just update if necessary and you see it redraws we got a pretty good selection on the sky I can move those around until I get the type of overlap that I want that's looking pretty good I really like that ability the key there is clicking over here on the right so you can sort of view a mask of those control points All right. There's my image. I'm pretty happy. I'm going to go ahead and twirl this up. I'm fine with my selective adjustments and we'll just do a little bit of finishing here. Notice we have the ability for a nice curve. So we have different standard types of curves we can work with here and it's just loading those curves in for you. Now like any type of adjustment you can always refine the curve and this is very similar to Photoshop. So if I want to lift the highlights a little bit and brighten them I can or perhaps pull down the shadows just a little let's round that out and you see that's working nicely plus you can grab the middle here and sort of make an overall lift as needed that's darkening down the middle gamma or we can pull it to the left and sort of open up the midtones a bit there we go that's just about right and then of course the ability to add our vignette we could place the center of the vignette and then adjust how much of a vignette we actually want. So let's turn that on. We'll do sort of a black frame. And I could adjust the amount of how dark it gets at the edges. Increase the transition amount so there's more from dark to edge. And play with the size. Which is going to be the overall size of that vignette. There we go. Just pull that down a bit going to back off the amount a little bit more. There we go, that looks pretty good. And you have the ability to change it from the ability to change it from rectangular to circular. That's looking good. I'm happy with the vignette. Scroll all the way down. Down here we do have the ability to sort of move through a loop. And you can also switch on over to a histogram if you want to see your levels. That's looking good. I'm happy with that overall effect and I'm going to click OK and it will be applied to the image. Now you remember earlier we told this to be created as a smart object. The cool thing there is that this will actually store all of these filter settings as a smart filter. That means at any point in time if you double click on the filter you could jump back in to your actual image and make tweaks and enhancements. That means the filter effect is still live and at any point a simple double click will re-engage this HDRFX dialog box and you can go in and start to manipulate. So I think that's going to really be a huge boost to this, the fact that you retain that flexibility. So that's looking pretty good and I want to point out a big deal here. Notice we've got this mask applied to our smart filters. So if I've got some areas that are a little too bright, it's pretty easy to go ahead and mask it out. I can just click on the mask, grab my paintbrush, and start to actually paint. Let's go ahead here with a nice simple brush. 
we'll just choose our normal paintbrush tool. There we go. Right bracket, bigger brush. And what I could do is paint on any areas here that were a little too hot. So I'm just toning down that space needle a little bit by painting on the mask. And in this case, I'm painting with a 36% opacity brush. And what it did there is it created a little mask between the two effects and it blended it just a little bit on that part. I also have the ability here to go ahead and sort of tone things down a bit. So I'll select this and I'm going to paint on the bushes a little bit further. Right bracket, bigger brush. And I'm just going to blend that back a little. And you see how it's mixing the before filtered image with the after. So that's looking pretty good. Build that up a little bit. And there's the mask attached. And that's another cool use of the smart filter. Now let's go ahead and grab the crop tool here. And I am going to load in a target aspect ratio. In this case, I'm going 16 by 9 and a resolution of 240 for printing. And as I crop that out, you see that it gives me my perspective guides. Everything's all set. I'm going to tell that to go ahead and hide the cropped area, not delete it. This way, if I change my mind, it's still there. So if after the crop, I want to make a little adjustment, I can go ahead and nudge that in. Now, when you apply the crop, the smart filter takes a second to kick back in. So don't panic. It's going to redraw it. But you see there that that's really doing a good job of quickly keeping non-destructive editing. So again, the little smart filters mask over here is pretty cool. You do make a major adjustment like a crop and a resize, the filter is going to have to recalculate. So don't panic when that happens. This is a very high res photo. So it's going to take a second as it kicks back in. Good. Click back on that mask, grab my paintbrush. I'm going to go just a little darker right now and tone down these areas. And notice I'm just masking back to the original photo. So it's not like I'm dodging or burning those trees. I'm simply painting them back non-destructively to their original point. There we go. And that looks pretty good. So at that point, my image is virtually done. The only issue here is notice it's a 32-bit image. Now that's great, and I'm going to save this, and we're going to store this as a 32-bit file so we can make future changes. So file, save as. Let's just put that out. And that's great. It's a 32-bit file. But if we were to save this as a JPEG for the web because we wanted to post it, or as a 16-bit file in order to print it, it gets a little confusing because all of a sudden now, all of these HDR details are going to be lost. And by default, that conversion can be a little wacky. But there is a little secret here that allows you to do the conversion. So see, for example, here, if I said, oh, let's go ahead and save this for web. Well, I can't yet because it's a 32-bit file. So we have to go down to a 16-bit file, and when I do that, it's going to go ahead and get a little bit converted. Now, we're going to merge those smart objects, and notice, boom, the colors all change. That's okay. What we want to do here is under method, we're going to go ahead and we're simply going to change this. Let's do simply exposure and gamma, and notice if I just leave that alone, nothing's changing. So as long as we set exposure and gamma as opposed to highlights or histograms or local, leave everything at 0 and 1, when you click OK, the 16-bit conversion happens with no additional HDR processing. So now we'll go ahead and save that and we'll just call this the 16-bit version, HDR 16. There we go. And we are free to store this out and any format that we want, JPEG or anything else. File, save for web and devices, comes up. In this case, it's a little bit big, no big deal. I'm going to go ahead and size this down for tip squirrel. We'll take this to 1,200 pixels wide. Press the tab key, everything refreshes. Hit save. There we go. Store it out. And there you have it. There is our HDR image. So, looks pretty good. Here's a slightly different version I made before. Still, all in all, quite happy with it. And remember, that all starts with taking advantage of that bracketing mode on your HDR camera. So, hope that makes sense to you guys. Thanks for checking us out at tipsquirrel.com. And be sure to check out some of the other great things we have up here on the website.